Hey everybody, this is Anne coming at you live on Reaper Pro Tips. Good morning or evening or afternoon or night or whatever the heck it is outside for you. For me, it is morning. Uh, mid-ish morning, I guess. Early-ish mid-morning? I don't know, what's 9.30? 9.30 just doesn't know what it is, right? It's not early morning and it's not properly mid-morning yet. Hello, hello. Certainly not late morning. Hello, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Hey, Gergie, thanks for the sub. Two-month streak, subbed for three months. Very nice. Thank you. All of our subs count now toward our big AMA and giveaway. So you know you want your sub to, you want to use your sub on this show. Especially if you have Amazon Prime and you have not yet assigned your tw free Twitch Prime sub, you totally need to sub this show. Pull I second shoe. Huh? I second that. You second that? Yes. Justin seconds that. I love the Pikachu emoji. I like, first of all, I love yellow things. Yellow is like my favorite color. Not purple. I know. I know you're all going, what? Um, but, and I love Pikachu because he is yellow and also extremely cute. So, all about it. All right. Oh, thank you, Kaz. 14 months in a row. Or, or at least 14 months, if not in a row. Still impressive. Hello. 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 There are so many of you. I'm just going to go generally hello to Le Monde. And, oh, thank you on the road to tea and at gifts a sub. Super. Thank you. And, of course, that is another way to get to our goal. Where are we anyway, Justin? We got a couple subs yesterday. Yeah, we're at seven subs as of right now. All right. So we have a ways to go, but that's okay. Every day is a small step toward the realization of our next giveaway. And Nomad Zeke, make that eight subs. 10 month streak, Nomad Zeke. Dang. Wow. Hey, Reaper John. Pikachu is the best waving emote. I, I agree with that. Absolutely. So let us, and we've got some bits cheer. Hype train. Yay. Yes, baby steps to AMAs. Baby steps to everything, really, right? It's not like anything happens instantly, usually in life. We all have to like do baby steps. That's why we watch these streams. Alrighty, so today, uh, today I decided I was feeling Rocky, but not Dragon Rocky. We'll do Dragon Rocky later in the week. But we're doing, um, we're going to do different stone colors because I decided that everybody does too much gray stone, darn it. So I'm going to tell you guys some colors to use for alternate colored stone. And also it lets me paint terrain, which we all know that I am, you know, secretly in love with. So we will switch to Cam, the Cam of Dagon. All right, so I wanted to talk about some yellowstone. I want to talk about a triad that we have for redstone. And I also wanted to talk about greenish stone and how to do greenish stone. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about all sorts of stuff. Thank you for all those gift subs, Numbat. Awesome. Very cool. I had too much gray stone, I feel called out. Well, all of us are called out, including me, Nomad Zeke. I am, I am uh, however, feeling very dissatisfied with my stone lately. So I thought that I needed to try something yellow. Because there is some very yellow stone in nature, right? So I dug up a reference photo that was kind of like the thoughts I was having. Um, and a lot of this yellow, uh, it has a lot of brown in it. It has a lot of gray in it. You know, it varies, right? And I like this pale yellowish uh, and grayish tones right here. So I thought I would do some fun stuff. Um, and the cool thing is that even if you do like gray, because it's nice and neutral and goes with everything, with the yellow stone and the green stone, you can actually start, still start with gray, and then you can just introduce other colors. So you still have a neutral-ish color, but you can introduce other stuff. And then, of course, there's the redstone triad, which is the dirt that you see in, like, Oklahoma and, like, other really high iron, high iron um, dirts where you, uh, if you look up red dirt, you'll find incredibly red pictures that you're like, must be photoshopped, but they're not. They re it really is this color. Um, I used to go up to Oklahoma a lot for little puppy evaluations and, uh, cause I had some breeders up there that I was helping and I would always, uh, drive past the red dirt and it looked so dang red next to the green grass. Um, so I decided he needed that triad. So this is a good triad. If you are doing something with a lot of green on it, and you want to maybe introduce a little bit of color, um, but you don't want to go like pure red, right? So it is really meant to be used as a triad. You have redstone, you have uh, the redstone shadow to put a wash on it if you'd like, or just paint your shadows in, and then you've got your redstone highlight. Redstone highlight, I've also used, and actually both of these colors, all of these colors, can also be really useful for demonic flesh. So make a mental note that not only is your redstone triad useful for 
redstone, it is also really useful for demon skin because you often don't want demon skin just candy red. You want a reddish tone. You want it to look diabolic, but maybe it's a more humanoid demon and you really want it to also have a suggestion of humanoidness. So this stuff is really good for that. Um, I love it. I especially love if you're doing succubi and you want them to kind of have a little bit of a reddish undertone, but you want to highlight with normal skin tones, uh, you can use redstone highlight and highlight it with tan skin and it works fantastic. So let's see here. Um, actually the, uh, the dark sword stuff is pretty sedimentary. Um, they usually are doing a layered rocks. Also, uh, Mathophile, the thing is, the, then you have to uh, sculpt your own bases, you know. Learn to sculpt rocks. Rocks are one of the easiest things to sculpt. Actually, let me grab my Dark Sword model and show you. So, my paint-along tier on my Patreon, which is my $15 a month tier, we're painting this dragonkin. And uh, many of the rocks on the base are sculpted. And one of the first tutorials is, uh, well, we gotta get it. Gotta get out of that paint. It loves the paint. It doesn't want to show us the rock. There we go. So the, many of the rocks on the base are actually sculpted. They're hard to see because they're primed. But rocks are really easy to sculpt. And you can see the, this is the Dark Sword Integral Rock. It does actually have layers in it. So that would be a good candidate if you wanted to introduce like a red rock, the, this kind of stone. And this kind of stone is also super easy to sculpt. So just keep that in mind if you want to do what you want. And also, Mathophile, I'll point out, that, um, you know, in a fantasy world, it doesn't have to be just sedimentary rocks that are red. Um, so, you know, you can do it whatever you want. I, uh, I did some desert stones. I, I did, uh, some bases for my orcs back when I had an orc army. And, uh, since they were green, this was actually a great stone color for them. And I didn't really, didn't really care if it wasn't quite, you know, sedimentary. Um, and it was more chunky pumice rock. Actually, pumice is also this color. There are some, uh, some pumices that are this color. So you could do that also if, it, if you're doing volcanic rock. All right. But yes, there's so many rocks in the world. Expand your rock. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Georgia clay. Clay is, it, clay tends to be reddish, right? Exactly. And then, of course, you've got yellowish. Now, uh, let's actually just start doing something here since we're talking about colors and things and I want to get some yellow rock down. This is actually coming off really red right now. This is much yellower in person. Hmm, I don't know how to fix that. I don't think there's really a way I can fix it. Oh, there. If I put it right up there, you can see how yellow it is. So I'm looking at the these colors in here. Uh, as far as what I want to do. And I've got some colors here that work really well for various parts of this. Um, so a good place to start is actually our desert stone color and desert sand colors. If you're looking for more of a grayish yellow, you start there and then maybe you go up to something and we're going to start, we're going to be using all sorts of weird colors here, guys. So like I am actually highlighting my yellowstone with blonde hair highlight. Um, things like that. Uh, I might even glaze some blonde hair in there for some of this more yellowy stuff, more intensely yellow stuff in here. See it? So, and actually some of these, uh, some of these yellow rocks also have red in them, as you can see. There's just so many colors you can throw in your rocks. And then there is some definite gray stuff. I could use like a shield brown. I could use, uh, driftwood brown as a shadow potentially or a glaze to make it different. If I wanted to do some complementary stuff, I could use dusky skin. Remember dusky skin is a brown gray and it's got purple in it. So that actually could do a great, be a great shadow for this. Let's play with that. Um, another highlight that would be good would be say creamy ivory. It's not quite as yellow though. So if you want a really yellow stone, I recommend that you use something like buckskin pale or blonde highlight, something that's, that is as yellow as you want it to be. Um, otherwise your yellow is just not going to show up very well. So, and the other thing we could do is we could add in say stormy gray or uh, cloudy gray as a shadow for this thing as well. If we want to get those gray streaky shadows. Uh, so let's, uh, yeah, you can do that too. I mean, I actually have tiny pieces of slate, like actual slate as well. And that, that would be a, a good way to go with, actually with greenish rocks and slate is often greenish. Um, but yeah, paint rocks different. So let's start doing this. Let's get it down. Let's have some fun. 
Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And so again, it comes back to like, find yourself a good reference photo. And uh, I mean, you can worry if you're worried about realism, then do take a note of, you know, would this rock actually be this color in nature? But if you're not worried about realism and you're just looking for a color um, that works well for your basing, that isn't just dungeon tile gray, um, then, you know, branch out and don't worry about it. If anybody calls you on realism and you're painting a freaking unicorn, just point at the unicorn and say, a unicorn? And hopefully that shuts them up. Fantasy Worlds can have a modicum of realism, but I do not think it is demanded. Alrighty. I love the texture on this. Kevin has uh, done a fantastic job of sculpting this uh, Dagon statue. So as you can see, Desert Stone has a lot of yellow in it. And uh, I actually, when I created this color, this was a color that was a long time coming. Um, I really wanted to put it in somewhere and Bones gave me the opportunity to do so. Uh, it was the color that I used to just mix. I just mixed every batch that I, that I used, but it was the color I used for the Nefsokar bases, um, back when we were doing the Warlord armies, uh, Nefsokar was the Egyptian one. And, uh, I've always been an Egypt buff since I was little. Um, my dad went to Egypt and he, uh, when he was in the Navy and he had all sorts of slides of the temples and everything and. I was totally in Egypt as a kid and still, still rather, rather am. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I essentially have a couple of nice, uh, coffee table books on Egypt and I studied those for a good desert stone and sand color. So that is where desert stone and desert sand came from is, uh, actual photo references of Egypt. I don't know why Dagon has the Rosetta stone on his side, but he does. Maybe, maybe they, well, I guess in Cthulhu, they really do want you to read their tracts, don't they? Because that's how they get you. So that makes sense that, you know, a Cthulhu cult would uh, put a kind of Rosetta stone. It's like, and if you can't read Dagonish, this is your teach yourself Dagonish in, you know, teach yourself deep one in uh, handy one hour lessons, right? Of all the mythos, like, of, of all the evil gods, like, the Cthulian mythos is, is very pro-literacy. Well, right. Well, the sedimentary rock can be all sorts of colors, too. I love sedimentary rock because it is the easiest to sculpt. <laughs> And it's the most fun and you can paint it up, you know, because it is in layers, you have some fun uh, ways that you can paint it. Just going to block in a bunch of this stuff. Alrighty. And by the time I've blocked in the rest of this, the fin will be dry. We can go and start some interesting uh, gray and then we'll do some yellow. And we'll see how close I can get to making this look real. Because even if it is fantasy stone and I take liberties with what kind of stone it might have been, I still do like realism in my rocks as far as how I execute them. So I want them to look right. Alrighty. That's a pretty good. Yeah, it's good enough. We're going to be putting all sorts of colors on it. All right. So that's a good deserty yellowy color. That actually uh, is pretty, pretty yellowish to start with. Let's look at our, our reference photo. All right, so yeah. So this color is really close to some of these colors here. So that's good. Um, and then when I, if I look at it, I'm like, well, it goes up with a with a lighter color. It's got some bands and it's got some uh, some yellows where it's uh, maybe a little bit more chunky down here and here. Um, so got some bleached areas up top. All right. And it does have some grayish areas down in the, there. So let me uh, put some gray in my cracks. What are we going to do? Let's do stormy. Um, or maybe not. No, let's do cloudy. And uh, if I'm going to make this look like... Mm -hmm. I want this to kind of go together. So I have two choices. I can thin down the gray and apply it, or I can mix a little bit of my uh, sandy color into it. 
probably do both. Mixing a little bit of the sandy color into it, it's going to warm up the, um, the cloudy gray. And the reason I use cloudy and stormy for this, by the way, is that cloudy and stormy are true neutral grays. Um, any of the watery grays, um, rainy, cloudy, stormy, misty, all of those are, and foggy, are, um, are pure, just black and white. They have no other colors introduced. Any other color, any other gray color that you see in the Reaper uh, lineup usually has another color into, in it to make it more interesting. Um, but the, the rainy perspiration, <laughs> or sorry, um, precipitation colors are, uh, are all just white and black. So when you're looking to mix a gray into something and you don't want any weird color interactions, these guys are your, are your uh, go-tos for darker, darkening colors and graying out colors. And you can get some beautiful soft colors by mixing uh, the uh, cloudy gray into things. A lot of you may remember the koala I painted during our koala, um, our, our Australian bushfires, uh, sorry, for charity, uh, um, fundraising. That's it. Boy, brain this morning is just like, la 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 la. But anyway, um, so the koala I was painting was, a, had a really pretty blue tunic and that was, um, ultramarine blue plus, uh, cloudy gray, 50, 50. I'm just going to put some, uh, some gray in like the shadowy darker areas here. And I'm going to warm up my highlights. Now, when you add black to something and mute it out, and you are essentially, when you are adding gray to a color, you are also adding black necessarily. Um, it's going to recede from the eye. It's, uh, it's not going to be as vibrant. And so the viewer isn't going to look at it necessarily right away. So when you are, uh, doing, adding gray to things, I usually won't do it for a highlight. I'll usually do it for a shadow for that very reason. The shadows you kind of want to fade out and the highlights are where you're going to pick up your awesome stone detailing. So you want to be able to, here, let me get this up closer. Let me get fo focused in. Let me get, yeah, there we go. So now we're getting some, some grayed out areas. Um, and your, your vision is going to be more attracted. Let me see, getting some odd color shift this morning. Wake up camera, be good. There it is, a little warmer. There, I've got some Got colors intruding. There we go. That's better. There, that's better. So that's not like super dark though, but I am going to be doing highlighting. So I'll ask myself later if I need to put in a darker stormy gray. Right now I'm probably working with paint that's about four to one or three to one paint to water. So it's not super uh, thin. It's just a bit thin. I don't really care if I get a little bit of brush stroke in here because it's texture, right? So since we're doing stones, we don't so much have to worry. I think I do want some stormy gray just to get these cracks and markings though. Um, yeah, Kuriniko, not defective, but remember everybody's eyes see things with a slight shift. Everybody's eyes are different. Like you will see a, any given color slightly differently, just infinitesimally slightly for some people, but some, some people might have just the way their rods and codes line up. You know, you, you just, everybody sees things a little different. Um, so you may just find that, you know, that things may look warmer to you. Um, these are, uh, this, this, uh, black is the black pigment that's in these is actually more of a blue shift black. So. It could also be um, when you're looking at them next to something, maybe that just throws you off. Because remember, colors alter their appearance based on what they're next to. So if you paint with a lot of cool colors or you have a lot of cool colors sitting around and you look at these grays next to those cool colors, they are going to look warm to you because it will shift relative, right? More coffee near Reaper Collins. I cannot have coffee. I may have more tea after this. Um, all right, so we've got a darker gray now. I'm just going to use this straight up. I'm going to use it in these cracks. But yeah, definitely, words are hard for Anne today. It's just funny. I didn't sleep too bad. But sometimes there are just days, right? It's kind of why I went for rocks today, because I thought about doing a, a gold uh, NMM uh, rocky hatchling, right? But then I'm like, I don't know if I can even handle that today. <laughs> ah, dear me. Gonna add just a little bit more of some darker color in here. 
darken down this area here, darken down this area here, catch some of these scratches and pitting and stuff. So you can still introduce a fair amount of gray, but then we can bring it up more toward yellow. And you really do, as I was showing people earlier, you get, you get a lot of gray in your yellow stone. You have some gray tones here. You've got some gray tones here. You can see those pretty plainly. Some of that is shadow, but I mean, the sun is directly on this part and it still looks gray. Um, so you know that it's uh, it's got some serious gray in there. But right now we're definitely looking more of a light brown. So we want to go away from that and get us towards some yellows. I was really sad. I couldn't find my Pathfinder colors for the stream. And that's actually why we started late uh, because I was desperately searching for Cairn Stone um, and Osirian Sand which are two fantastic colors in Pathfinder that are great for this sort of thing. Like they're perfect. So I was really happy when I saw them on the uh, Pathfinder um, sheet to, to be created because we've, we don't have anything like that uh, for, for basing until those colors were created. So desert sand is uh is right there and it's not quite yellow enough like it's not as yellow as i want it to be so this is where i'm gonna maybe reach for my blonde hair or my blonde highlight or both or if you've got buckskin pale that's another great color or like i said osirian stand um karen stone is a gray with yellow in it it's it's a weird yellowish gray it's actually awesome and uh for this sort of thing uh and then the uh, osirian sand is a very yellow sand so pardon me while i find my pokey tool I'm in need of pokeying this bottle. It is very stubborn. But yeah, as you can see, I am going to be utilizing all sorts of things. So blonde, the reason I'm going for these, by the way, is that they're um, made with yellow oxide instead of straight up yellow pigment. And yellow oxide is kind of the color equivalent to yellow ochre these days. And uh, yellow ochre is, of course, a dirt color. So um, it makes sense then that you'd pick something with that color, uh, mixed with that color, in it to represent Yellowstone because it, it is actually a yellow dirt color. So as you can see, blonde hair looks a lot darker and yellower in the bottle than it does when it's mixed into things. Can't really even see, you can see a little bit of a yellower tint there. So adding a drop or two of this of that to this is gonna take it more golden, more in line with what I wanted to form my Yellowstone. I'm actually gonna put one more drop in there. Every day is Monday. Second Monday, huh, Daffodur? Yeah, I just, other than my problems with words today, I'm actually feeling pretty good. I've got, today is my get out of the house and go grocery shopping day. And although that stresses some people out, I kind of look forward to it. So it is go to the store thing day. Maybe pick up some stuff and make some apple crisp for dessert tonight. Thank you, Planer, for the plug. I mentioned my Patreon earlier. I'm going to mention it again. I do Patreon. I love my Patreon. I'm actually working now on my $5 PDF um, covering a few of the Dungeon Dwellers paints and what uh, tr what triads you could use for them, what uses they're good for them, good for. Um, and this month I am covering uh, the Ogre Skin, Knoll, Fur, and Kobold Scale colors. And I'm using them for everything but that. So... <laughs> Hopefully y'all will go over. That's the $5 tier is where I, I do a lot of Master Series colors breakdown. Um, and uh, I do uh, one of those a month. I also did a color wheel thing recently, just breaking down how to use a color wheel. Like how is a color wheel useful for miniature painting and how is it not useful? Um, a lot of people overcomplicate the color wheel. So there's a short video um, for the $5 tier also. So $5 people get an extra this month. Okay, so I'm a bit light here. Now I can either embrace the light and just try to do some texture with it, or I thin it a bit. Um, or I can mix a little bit of my previous color into it. All these things will make it uh, a little less overt, because there's definitely, a, you can see what a big difference there is between these two colors. So when you've got something like this, you either want to create a half and half mix of them, or mix at least mix one into the other, or you want to thin the light one a lot. Um, but I do kind of want to leave some brush strokes, because this is stone, and I want to leave texture, so I'm going to mix a little bit of my desert stone into this and add a little water kind of all the all the best worlds and then see if it's a little bit better oh 
Oh, thank you, Trashrama. Yeah, yeah. I've been trying to do people of color. I've got a couple of different uh, PDFs on that for 28 and for bust, I think. So definitely, definitely. I uh, I do put a lot of energy in my Patreon. I've got lots of levels and uh, I've been doing it since uh, late 2018. So it's got a lot of content up by this point. Um, if you go to around the new year this year, you'll see that I also did a PDF of everything I did in 2019 and 2018. So it's easier using that PDF to find the things that uh, you might be interested in. Those are also free PDFs. So if you haven't subbed for my Patreon, you can go take a look at them and see if there's topics that would interest you that might get you to sub. And if you don't want to sub, then you can just tune in and watch me every day do this stuff here. Although here it's a lot more distracting. Hey there, Socrates. You rock too. Mostly because your name is Socrates and that's awesome. I took a lot of philosophy courses in college. I was an art major and uh, being an art major, essentially they don't really care what your electives are. So I ended up taking a lot of philosophy, a lot of English, a lot of archaeology courses because my interests are weird um so i'm just using a bit of a stippling stroke now because i thinned my paint down a little bit remember i want a little bit of artifacts uh, I, I want brush strokes but i don't want the brush strokes to just be lines um i want them to be more like the pebbly texture of the stone um that's so weird trash rama and so weird reaper john hey dog father good to see you So I found out the other day that my nephew Graham was watching me um, do my stream the other day, which is really cool. Uh, I got he and his sister um, miniatures, Learn to Paint kits, uh, a couple of years ago for Christmas. They're uh, so, they're pretty artsy kids. Since my mom is artsy and I'm artsy, and uh, my brother's an architect, so you know he's even got the art gene a bit. So, uh, it's, it's cool. It's cool when you're, when your nephew thinks you're cool enough to tune into your Twitch stream, right? <laughs> um, I, my, the philosophy courses in, uh, UW Madison, um, Mathophile were, uh, you had to take, uh, logic as your 102 course. So I started with 101, took 102, and then by the time I was done, I was actually up into 500 level courses. I don't remember a lot of it, um, but it did definitely, uh, teach me a bit about um, logical thought and uh, the, it, what, what philosophy was really useful for, for me actually, is as a study of language. Because a lot of people, when they first take philosophy, they're just like, bah, they're just like, you know, they're just, these are just words, it's just words, and they don't get the concepts behind it. Because the interesting thing about philosophy is that it's trying to use a very limited medium, the human language, to try to frame these large, very large concepts, right? And to try to draw distinctions between things. And so for me as a writer, because I've always been, been the writerly type um, and English and language have always been huge interests for me, philosophy was interesting from that perspective, um, even as much as uh, it's itself, right? The big questions that it poses um, and the logical way that it sets out problems. So I really enjoyed it. Plus I was kind of very interested in religion always and the philosophy of it the philosophy of, of faith and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so I, uh, I did take philosophy of religion as I was a 400 level course. So, all right, let's see here. We got too much of this palette in the window. I think, let me see what we got. So we're bringing up our Yellowstone. Let me, let me get this guy in focus. Focus, Dagon, focus. There we go. There we are. Now you can see some nice texture. So, Let's see here. Just trying to catch up. Creepy. Hey, Achilles Blade. Yes, I am Auntie Anne, actually, Socrates. That is uh, that is what I sign all my cards to my niece and nephew. My brother had the kids and got me off the hook. Although I was I was not planning on having children anyway, but, you know. It is nice to have nieces and nephews, though, or a niece and a, and a nephew. Graham is my only nephew. Um, and Lauren is now my only niece. But yeah, they're cool kids. I'm kind of sad that the whole uh, coronavirus thing means I haven't been able to get up to Wisconsin. 
visit. But it is cool. And so, Graham, if you are tuning in again today, hi from Auntie Anne. There. Alrighty. So, pretty much just using some. I think I want a little bit more yellow. All right, people are, people are pretty much just kind of, you guys are like asleep today. Let's get some more yellowy color in here. I think I want, there's some very yellow, very yellow stuff here. I think I want to go more in this direction. So to do that, I'm going to need a yellowy color. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to actually use one of the Dungeon Dwellers colors that I'm going to be talking about in my PDF this month. Uh, Mathophile, actually, when uh, when I was three and a half and we picked my mom up from the hospital and she had just had my little brother, um, I asked her if having him hurt and she said yes. And I looked at her and I said, I am never having children, little three year old, three and a half year old Anne. And I never went back on it. <laughs> so I, I got to say it was kind of expected <laughs> when you start that early, when you start that early and you never budge ever. Um, for decades, your, your parents are pretty much sure that you're not going to have kids. All right. So we're using ogre skin. It is tremendously yellow. It also has a lot of ochre in it. Gesundheit, Kiri. That was a dog sneeze. All right. So this is alarmingly yellow, alarmingly yellow. Um, but ogre skin does have a lot of ochre in it. It has a lot of other color too, but you can kind of see it's uh, actually what this color is good for is uh, it, it's just a very versatile, intense, dark yellow. We're going to do a glaze. I want to get more yellowy and this might be too yellow. What I can do to it is remember our blonde hair that I was using in this color. Remember, pull everything together by using a little bit of X color in Y color and then X color and Z color too. So we'll mix a little bit of that and that's going to give us a much more natural ochre look, right? Not as, not nearly as bright. And we're going to drop a ton of water in it because we want to glaze, remember? And I often test them on my fingernail to see. Yeah, that's perfect. That's almost invisible, but you can definitely see the yellow, yellow stripe. So perfect. Yeah, yeah, no Medzi. Yeah, parents are that way. What you gonna do? All right, so I'm gonna get a lot of this and I'm gonna try to paint it in a nice thin layer over this area. I'm gonna try not to let it pool. Remember our lessons from yesterday. You don't let the glaze pool ever. You wanna paint it over. If you're good, you won't even let it pool at the beginning. You just paint it over in a really thin layer using a very large brush. And you can usually hit the whole layer. Now look at how yellow we've gone. That's actually a really nice Yellowstone, I think. We'll let it dry. It looks more intense wet than it will dry. But you can see how we went from really a brownish color here. Now we're starting to look a lot more yellow. So that glaze is... Uh... Yeah, I mean, that's the good attitude, right, Reg and I? We wish it, we wish parents would uh, would just say that whatever. Uh, maybe a lot of people want grandkids, and I don't, yeah, I don't blame them. That's fine, whatever. I just don't like people pressuring other people into doing things, whatever the reasons. It doesn't matter what the subject matter is. Uh, I've kind of messed up this area. I should have gone a little lighter on it. So now I come back, and I can still use this color, but because I've gone with this yellow glaze, it's going to look a lot more warm and golden. This is a good yellow. I would call this a, a neutral yellow. Like it's a kind of a golden color, but it's got some gray tones in it. It's, uh, you know, I'm highlighting it again with a color that's not overly yellow and is more neutral. So this is a good colored stone color uh, that's versatile because it's not overly yellow, right? Because you want, you want to switch it up and maybe do a different stone color, but you also don't want it to be so yellow that it distracts the eye. So that's the point of muting it out, right? So this is, I'd say, a pretty good color to go as a ground color for a lot of different models. 
I could even do a ground color like this on my dragon kin, and it wouldn't be, it looks very deserty, but it's not terrible on him, you know? So one thing you could do is to paint a bunch of bases in different stone colors or a bunch of even little sections of like plastic card or whatever. And then kind of when you're painting a model, if you haven't decided on your base color, you can do what I just did and hold it up against the model and kind of test it out with the color scheme of the model. So that is a good idea to do, especially if you're looking for alternative colors. Yeah, yeah, my mom, uh, yeah, so the grand dogs. I get asked how the grand dog is doing. Yeah, I mean, it's perfectly fair. If you don't want kids, I mean, I'd rather that people don't who don't want kids don't have kids because, you know, you're probably not going to be very committed. And it, they, I mean, they take a huge amount of time and energy and parenting is hard. Um, you know, after watching my friends with their kids and my brother with his kids, it's not easy. I have the greatest respect for people who do a good job of raising their kids and who raise, in, you know, kids who are good people and who will contribute, you know, well to society and, you know not be the horrible, you know, people. Parents who take on that responsibility, it is so much time and effort. They, all the props, people. All the props. I just always felt that I would be a terrible mother. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I mean, even raising a dog to be a good, a good dog individual uh, can be difficult. Kids are 20 times harder. Is they're smart enough to challenge you. So yes. Alrighty. So that's a nice, I'd say that's a really good yellow stone color, actually. I'm happy with this. This is good. Let's do some green. What do I want to do green? Let's do green on the underfin. What do we got? We're about 10, 14. Yeah, we got, we got time. Kids aren't as, aren't as food motivated as dogs. Depends on the kid. I, I'd argue that teenage boys, uh, do aspire to that level of food motivation. <laughs> uh, but it depends, right? All right, so I'm gonna lay down some cloudy and some, uh, these are these are too thin. However, that said, uh, you can see how washing the model lets my paint stick to bones even when it's really thin. So like I could go with this if I really felt like it, but I'm gonna thicken it up because I want a more solid coat. So let's drop some more uh, cloudy gray into our mixture and drop some more stormy gray into our mixture. We're gonna start with a gray on our greenish stone because greenish stone still has a lot of gray in it. Man, see, I can't stand litter boxes, Trash Rama. I've owned both cats and dogs for many, many years, pretty much since I could own an animal. Um, I had a brief break after while I was in college, but the minute I could own an animal again, I went for it. And, and I just don't like the litter box. Um, I mean, it is a pain in the butt to have to take Kiri for four walks a day, but at least she gets me outside and walking. So I'm, I'm, uh, more in favor these days of dogs than cats. Although after Kiri leaves us, I'm probably going to go a little while without an animal because this uh, this apartment is not ideal for a puppy. So I'll have to wait until I get my next Shiloh. But the cool thing is that since Kiri was a show dog, she actually had puppies, and so I will be able to get a descendant of Kiri when I get another Shiloh. Which is pretty cool, actually. Three kids in a three-bedroom, two-bath house. Woof. Yeah, I had a very expensive litter box as my for my last kitty. Um, one of those automatic ones. And that was that that was nice, but it still takes up a lot of room. And in an apartment, it's hard sometimes to find a, a place for, a good place for the litter box. Yeah, I mean, to each your own. There are all sorts of pets in the world that are awesome, so. 
and cats are a lot less work in general. You are right. Okay. <laughs> you prefer to be the child. Alrighty, so we got a nice gray, a nice gray here. We've got some darker gray and some medium gray. When you're doing greenish stone, especially if you're trying to in, um, give the uh, opinion or uh, the impression that it's wet, swamp green is a great green to mix in to start with, um, or to glaze over the top. If you're trying to make the stone look wet and maybe like it's growing um, algae or uh, moss or something then glaze with your swamp green. But if you're going for an actual greenish stone, I would actually mix the stormy gray into your swamp green or, or some of your swamp green into your stormy gray, vice versa. There we go. So just a little bit of green, depending on how green you want it, little green goes a long way. So perhaps instead you want to start with a greener color. We'll do this two ways since we've got the base coat down. We'll base coat with our dark green or a green. So this is probably a mix of, I mean, probably seriously six drops of the stormy gray and maybe one drop of the swamp green. I don't want it too green. I want it just to give it that little bit. Cause right. Cause greenish stone isn't really a bright green unless you're talking emeralds. It, it's more got that kind of tone to it. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, there's some slate that's kind of greenish and you know, other stuff like that. Now, if you want a wet look, then using your swamp green as a glaze over gray stone is a great idea too. And that will help you introduce um, greenish tones without going for an actually greenish stone. Uh, yeah, that's the downside of, of pets, right? Is that you know they're going to leave you. So I'm just glazing a little bit of the swamp green over the top of this gray and you can see how much more green that makes it like this is mixing your swamp green in and this is putting an actual glaze layer of swamp green over the top. So it definitely gives you different effects, right? But this does look this, this glaze does succeed in making it look kind of slimy. Um, you know, like kind of like it's, uh, it's got some sort of, um, moss like or lichen growing on it, especially when it gets kind of patchy. Um, so if you take some gray and you, uh, put some of these gray tones back in over the top of that green and you kind of make it more splotchy, it even more looks like there is a moss or lichen growing up onto the stone. So two very different effects with the same colors, the same combo, just a different effect. So for my greenish stone, Alrighty, hold on. Yeah, I mean, especially if it really is out in the ocean, right? Because then you want to show that there's like, you know, some sort of uh, algae growing on it. Right, trash? I assume that Justin uh, spelled the name of the stream wrong. Was that, was that why everybody's saying altar versus altar? I missed that earlier. In which case, when you're doing this, uh, try to look at, focus your green glazes um, in the in the deep cracks. Oh, where... you're not wrong. I definitely misspelled that. Wow. Justin's not awake either. Um, yeah, I did just get done feeding my cat, which is an ordeal. Well, not yes. just now, but earlier, yeah. Yes. So uh, concentrate your green in the areas where water would pool, because then it makes sense that there would be uh, algae growth there. So you can make your green much darker and wetter in the areas where it would uh, fall in pool. Uh, and that also helps to bring out all these great details in the stone. So you can make it quite green. And then uh, if you want it to be very wet, as we talked about in our uh, uh, Spirit Beast uh, series a couple weeks back, uh, you can put an actual gloss coating over the areas that you want to appear actually wet. There. So that you can see how green that comes up now. Now this doesn't look greenish hardly at all. So two greens, if you want to do actual greenish stone, 
two greens you can use that are good uh, calls for this. One is Pathfinder, one is uh, Kickstarter, Reaper, Core, Jungle Mist, and Boggard Green. And you could actually use both of these. Um, this is obviously going to give you, it's a little bit of a cooler color. And it's more grayed out. Uh, it's not, it's got a bit of blue in it. And the Boggard Green has a lot more yellow in it. So it really depends on, on which greenish, you know, how you want to take your stone. Um, let's do a mix with this and... Jungle Mist and Cloudy Gray. I probably wouldn't use this straight up because it is very green. I probably would introduce a little bit of gray into it if you're gonna use it for greenish stone. So let's take that. I have a bunch of very interesting colors on my palette today. So three drops of Jungle Mist. Let's throw a drop of Cloudy Gray in there. Then let's get some Boggard Green mixed up. I do love the off greens in Pathfinder. I did a PDF on them, I want to say last month, on the Pathfinder Weird Greens, and Boggard was one of them. Uh, Medusa was one of them, and then uh, one of the other ones was the other one who, that sells so darn well. Um, but yeah, so that is, uh, I do like the, I think the off greens are just good for naturalistic subjects. They're very useful, so you don't have to mix up a color yourself that might fit that bill because these have so many other different colors in them. This is actually a really good a grayed out stone color that's greenish. Um, this was the one drop of cloudy gray and the three drops of jungle mist. Uh, I like this color a lot. This looks really real to me, uh, especially if I start mixing it a bit with my cloudy gray here. Simulate seaweed. Yeah, scotch bright pad could work. Um, eh, it depends. It can be hard sometimes to get those micro effects and have them look convincing. So this by itself might be too, um, a bit too, a bit too light. Let's see. Yeah, that's, that's really light. So we're going to actually grab a little bit of our cloudy gray. Darken it down a little bit. And remember, if you really want this to come up more greenish, you can always do a glaze like I did over here, but with a different green if you wanted to. Yeah, this is very, very, very light. So let's get some some lighter gray in there. May need to get my uh, get my stone texture in here with my cloudy gray first, because I, I did do stormy gray and... Uh, Stormy gray and swamp green for this. So I did take it quite dark. So this is a very light color for me to be trying to put on top of this. Though I could do it and then just go for it and do a glaze of gray over the top of it also. That's totally, totally legal. You can get there any way you want to. As long as you get there. And again, I'm just kind of random dabbing here. I, there isn't a lot of texture actually sculpted on stone here. Here and there, there is down here. But up here, it's pretty smooth. So I could just use randomized texture that I create to bring out this, uh, this stones. And I'm going back and forth between just a pure cloudy gray and my lighter uh, green mixture of, of cloudy gray and uh, boggard green, or jungle mist, sorry. Do be sure to hit all the lower edges of all these um, these cuts. Wherever the, the light would hit, you want to hit that lower edge that's standing out. It makes the light, uh, the lighter you make it, the more dramatic the light will appear to be coming from the top. See how that, that brings out that crack right there. Same thing with here. You want to pick this out. You want to pick out the bottom of this one. You want to pick out the bottom of this one. Anywhere the light would catch where it's falling, you want to accent that here. Just real thin line or stippled line to bring all those nice sharp details out. Now we're looking like we're actually looking like greenish stone at this point. This is good. This is good. It's working. Yay. It's always good when it's working. 
The paint doesn't hate me today. It may be dubious about me, but it doesn't hate me. So again, down here, there isn't a lot of actual sculpted texture, so I'm just gonna make some random brush marks. Then maybe I'll come back with another gray and put a slightly uh, different stipple on top of it. Maybe I'll grab some of my stormy gray, darker gray, stipple that in down there. You're really just at this point looking for random texture that you can work off of. You can even use the side of your brush to make longer strokes and dashes. Let's see how I'm getting all this. I'm using a very large brush so that I can do that. I can utilize a bigger, broader, dashy stroke, or I can use a tiny little stipples because this is a Raphael um, 8408. So it has a very fine tip, even though it's a very large brush. And it's quite good for this sort of thing. You can get really fine detail and larger, bulkier texture. That actually is a pretty convincing greenish rock, actually. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, well, I'm going to actually use some of my Boggard green uh, as a final highlight here. This is a pale yellowy green color. Putting a bunch of water in it. Good, good suggestions on seaweed there. Have I ever needed all of my palace walls? Uh, Jenna Rose, I'm kind of a, a stickler on the fresh sheet of paper uh, thing since I was a 2D artist first. So when my palette gets a certain level of crowded, I get annoyed at it. I have used almost all of my wells for one thing at, uh, at least once. And usually it's when I'm working on a model and I'm working on skin tones, but I'm also working on say another grouping of colors on the model. Um, and maybe I've got a lot of intermediate mixes and then maybe if I paint for a very long time and I finish or half finish parts, then I'll, I'll fill up a lot of wells. Um, but usually I don't like sometimes though, what I'll do is I'll use the top set of wells for one project and then I'll use cling wrap and I'll cling wrap over and leave the cling wrap just over those top wells. And then I'll use the bottom set of wells for a different project. And, uh, then I can cling wrap the whole thing and I can have my colors stay good uh, for, you know, a day or two if, for working on two different projects instead of just one. I also have an extra one of these palettes, so it, uh, I could, I could technically have four projects open at once, but then I know that I'm really uh, having problems with multitasking and I'm not focusing well enough. So I'm going to take this Boggard green. It is even a little bit lighter than our previous green and I'm going to kind of speckle. And when you do a stippling, uh, stippling means little tiny dots and dashes all in a row. Um, with the tip of your brush usually. And when you do a stippling stroke instead of a line here, what you're doing is you're actually suggesting that, suggesting that this is a rough edge, that the stone texture is here, that this was not carved, a carved edge to be smooth. This was actually just gouged out by something. Um, and so that's two different effects that you can get. If you use a smooth line, then you imply that a chisel was at work at some point and this was intentionally carved. Um, but if you use a rough line, then you imply that it's ragged, that there is in fact micro texture here. Maybe not, not quite visible to the naked eye, but visible just where the light glances off of an edge. So you could choose which, uh, which thing to go for, which effect to go for, depending on what you're painting. Alrighty, leave this little one here. Uh, alrighty, we are getting there. Um, I think this is actually coming up really nice. And both, both of these are greenish in different ways, right? This one looks like it's got stuff growing on it. Whereas this one is definitely more of just a dark, moody, greenish stone, which would be good for Dagon in general, right? Um, so... And I didn't need that much green, right? I was using just a, a little bit of swamp green mixed into my base uh, stormy gray. And then I was using grayish greens to highlight it. And it came up quite convincingly greenish. I can definitely see the green in it, uh, even next to this. So I hope that uh, that makes sense to you guys, what I've done so far. Whenever you want to, you it never hurts to throw a, a color into your stonework. Even if you're doing gray stone, even if you want, even if you want gray stone, throwing a little bit of dark green or blue or even red or purple or something or brown into it can help it look more interesting um, and not detract too much from the color. 
But like this greenish stone would be a really good thing to put on a model that's really uh, like has a vibrant red on it. Like if you're painting a, like a vampire knight, right? Um, then this sort of, of dark gray but still greenish stone would make his, maybe if his armor is red or his cloak is red, it'll make those areas look even more red. Because remember, complementary color will intensify the appearance of its complement. So you could really make his red pop by using just a subtle greenish stone on the base for him, for example. So think about stuff like that. Uh, it's, you, when you when you uh, look at color schemes, if you're not using a complementary color, but you think you might like uh, to have the, the pop um, that they give to their complement, then think about sneaking it in somewhere. Think about sneaking it into your basing, for example. And I'm just kind of using, uh, getting a little bit more stippling texture on here, making my rock a little bit more interesting here. Picking up some areas that I didn't play with before. The more I bring this up, the more I can bring this texture to where you really see it. And I love areas like this. The reason I say te uh, Kevin did such a good job on this sculpt is um, that it, there is a, and there's just enough texture here. There, there are some nice smooth areas for you to like put whatever you want in there. And then there, but there's enough really nicely sculpted texture to make this area very interesting. So it's not just boring stone. This, if I painted this whole idol like this, it would really look cool, right? It, you'd get so many details in the stonework, not just even the runes, but everything else. Um, just the random stonework patterns are really, really nicely done. Well done, Kevin. Well done. That'd be Kevin Williams, our staff sculptor at Reaper. I think we're pretty looking pretty good actually any questions guys any questions I'm just gonna keep stippling on my uh, boggard green because adding my yellowy green to my highlights makes me happy and the more I bring up these edges and areas the more interesting it's going to be and just, if you want to practice just a randomized stroke, just kind of like get a brush and stipple and go for something with a big broad area like this and just kind of practice randomizing your texture and using just, just a tiny bit of paint on the brush. If there was a lot of paint on the brush, I'd be getting big watery blobs, right? So you really just want to clean a lot of paint off your brush to the point where you're really not seeing, you know, you're seeing just a bit and you can just dot it. You can even test it on your fingernail to make sure that you're not getting a big puddle or pool and then just go at it. You can even suggest some uh, cracks that aren't there in this manner. So like say I decided I wanted a crack to come off of here. I can create that crack just by building up a line, a lighter line of stippling. Let's grab a little bit of this too. So let's do an artificial crack. So I'm going to define, this would be the lower edge, remember? Because remember we've been highlighting lower edges because that's where the light is going to catch. Then we can take a dark gray or black, probably my dark, dark gray, and uh, dark gray and green. Uh, we can suggest right above that a dark shadow. So we're kind of playing with this area here. I might need to actually make it a little darker in there and a little lighter underneath. So see how that, see how that line there, that crack there is starting to come out now? And then if we take a really light color and accentuate it, we can just draw some, draw a crack that doesn't exist onto here. There. So now we've got an extra crack. And this is totally just paint, but it looks like a crack. So all of these sort of things that you can do to suggest texture where there really isn't texture, but who know, nobody's gonna know but you. They'd have to look really close to tell that you painted it on. Especially if you camouflage it in with the way that you've done the rest of this stuff and it all looks uh, similar. Then I'd have to look really close. There we go. Now we have created a crack. <laughs> You can get a certain amount of my talent through osmosis, um, Miss Dimp, uh, tell her. 
Um, I mean, you'll learn a lot just from watching me, right? Especially if you make a note like of, of how much paint I'm using, how I'm unloading my brush, you know, kind of like that. But then to get the, um, to get the brush control, you're going to have to actually paint. So there is a certain amount that you can absorb, but after that point, you must paint. And this is true of anything, uh, any art or craft that you pick up, right? It's like you can get a certain amount through watching videos, but there does come the point when you will not get better unless you actually paint things. I'm going to try to create a little extra fissure crack here. That doesn't exist. I'm creating it. A little bit of... Uh, additional detail up here where I made a little notch there with a little highlight. That's totally artificial and doesn't exist, but I made it anyway. Hey, hey, Bragarn. Yeah, I am the person who created the Reaper Master Series paint line for Reaper. So I'm Ann Forster. I worked for Reaper for 17 years, 15 of those on site creating the Reaper Master Series paint line. Um, and then, uh, I recently moved to the West coast to be with my boyfriend and, uh, but now I'm, now I stream for Reaper because I know the paint line forward and back. I created from the ground up. I created all the colors from the ground up. Um, now we have my uh, protege Sadie is, uh, taking over the department in my, uh, as since I left, uh, but I still do work for Reaper on stream. So yeah. I, uh, I do MSP for almost everything. I will say, if I must give a plug to a secondary paint line, that one of the other paint lines out there that I enjoy is the Scale 75 Artist Series, which is the tube paints. But that's possibly because I come from a 2D art background as well. Uh, I went to art school, so I'm comfortable with tube paint. And even though you have to like thin the bejeebus out of them to get them to the consistency you want uh, for miniature painting. But yeah, um, MSP is a little bit of a different beast. I created it to kind of go well with my painting style. A lot of paints out there go very high coverage out of the bottle because they really want you to be able to get a solid base coat. But I'm only doing a base coat once. And so a lot of the time I find that more often I want transparency in my paint. And so MSP is a little bit more of a fluid consistency out of the bottle. You don't have to thin it as much to make it into a good wash or glaze, mostly because what a lot of what I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of thinned paint applications. So uh, essentially I like to paint that, that would let me get it to where I wanted it faster. And I also wanted to paint that stuck better, that adhered better. And a lot of the time adhesion goes hand in hand with um, a harder paint and that tends to be also a more transparent paint. Like all this is paint chemistry stuff that I learned when I was teaching myself um, in order to make Reaper's paint line and to make educated decisions about it. So for me, I want some a paint that's going to stick really well to the model. And so that made a certain decision for me because there's just certain resins that you're using in paint production that are going to give you hardness, but also they have transparency. Or they've got, you know, maybe this has high coverage, but it's a really soft paint. It peels off really easy, you know. Or maybe this has a lot of coverage, but it's a really thick paint. And so you have to work with it a lot to get it to a, a level where it's transparent. You know, there's all these are all choices that you make when you design a paint line. Um, so do keep in mind if you're used to a thicker paint, when you go to MSP, you're going to be like, this is really fluid. That's intentional. So you might have to do two, two coats, two thin coats to get a good solid base coat on it. But then after that, when you're doing washes or glazes or trying to blend or things like that, a lot of it, the, the paint will adjust a lot faster to the level that you need it. Yeah. Uh, favorite yellow in the MSP line. Ooh, that's so hard. I love yellow. I love yellow so much. And it varies. Um, I mean, it's like utilitarian yellow. I've got to go with lantern. Like as far as just dead useful in so many different ways, lantern or candlelight maybe, um, as as far as general use. But then as far as weird yellows go, huh? Oh, I really do like that Cairn stone from Pathfinder. It's a gray, a yellow gray, but it's really cool. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other yellows that I really really like. Golden Glow was one of the holiday colors. That's actually my signature color. Like all of our painters at one point were kind of making up a signature color, and Golden Glow was mine. Um, gosh, but lemon yellow is so useful and probably the yellow that I reach for most often you can tell because the bottle is full of <laughs> fingerprints and brush marks is my NMM gold highlight. This is such a freaking versatile color. I cannot even say how many things I reach for this all the time. If you, t if you're on my Patreon, you will see me reach for 9303 all the time for a highlighting color for a lot of different things, for everything from oranges to greens to to, you know, golds and browns and, uh, you know, you name it, skin tones even. I've been using to highlight skin tones. Um, so 
NMM gold highlight, one of my favorite all time yellows. So there we go. So Justin, do you have, let me see. Uh, yeah, the how is hard with, especially with watercolor, right, Safroko? Because so much matters with watercolor. The size of your brush, how much of a paint load you have on it, you know, the material your brush is made of. Have you wet the paper or not? You know, all this stuff is crazy with watercolor. I feel, I used to paint a lot with watercolor, but it was mostly messing around. And I feel like these days with people like Jessica Rich in the world and uh, Stephanie Law, I'm just like, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. So uh, I, I, it was funny because I hated acrylics in grade school and high school and college. I hated acrylics. And now what am I a master of? Acrylics. <laughs> it's so silly how things work out. All right, Justin, do we have a raid or anything? Yes, actually. We do. Awesome. What and who we and how? are going to be raiding Jimmy. Jimmy. It's going to be Jimmy. What's Jimmy painting today? Do you know? Let's see. I had it pulled up earlier, but I didn't refresh. Hold oh, on. okay. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, it looks like uh, Avelina is painting a goblin, and I Jimmy's is not currently on screen. Oh, okay. Cool. Well, neat. Non-human skin tone is always good, and things like that. All right, guys. Well, thank you for tuning in to my, my rock lesson. I hope that Maybe you... Maybe uh... that's kobold, actually. Oh, okay. Oh. I hope... Well, that's even better. I like kobolds better. <laughs> I'm, I'm pro kobold. I'm on team kobold, as far as monsters go. Kobolds are so entertaining. Um, but yes, yeah, so I hope you had fun tomorrow. Maybe we'll do a different sort of Rocky. We'll do Rocky, maybe the dragon. I don't know. I do want to try to paint a Rocky on stream. Um, so at least one, I have three. So, uh, we might, we might do, re uh, the, the week of Rocky. Uh, we might just, uh, do a fun little dragon scale thing. Um, maybe we'll try a black dragon and a gold dragon. You know, we'll do different things like that. I don't know. Whatever. I'm just I'm just chilling this week, guys. I'm just chilling this week. We can uh, we can just play it by ear and uh, have some fun. How about that? And I hope you all had fun. Oh, I also have a rock troll that has gems on him. So at some point, guys, you're gonna get a gemstone tutorial. Not yet, but close, close. I like the model, so we'll see what we can do. Maybe we'll do troll skin next week, and then maybe some gemstones. So these are all the all the awesome models that I just ordered from Reaper. I also have a, a dumpster, which I badly want to do graffiti and rust effects on. So you might get dumpster also. <laughs> you won't get dumpstered, but you but you might get dumpster. <laughs> all right, guys. All right, guys. Um, yeah. Otter Mama, I might do black hair for the Patreon. I'm not sure. Have I done black hair for the Patreon? I don't remember. I don't remember. But we'll we'll think about it. All righty. All right, guys. Okay. Keep being awesome. Have Spread fun, the Reaper guys. love. Bye. See you tomorrow. And don't forget Tune to in. catch the uh, Proctor show this afternoon at 4 p.m. Central. We'll have Derek Schubert on. It'll be great. All right. We'll see you guys later.